Good morning. We're working our way through Paul's letter to the Romans. In this letter, Paul lays out foundational Christian truths, basic truths that we are to build on. This morning, Paul will unveil mysteries that Old Testament prophets and righteous individuals longed to understand. And the mystery has to do with God's dealings with the Jews, how in God's hands, mysterious ways result in merciful ends. Um, There's a sheet with the text in it. Let's work our way through it. Um, What it says in Romans 11, 17, Paul writes, but if some of the branches were broken off and you, although a wild olive shoot, were grafted in among the others and now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant toward the branches. If you are, remember, it is not you who support the root, but the root that supports you. Then you will say, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. That is true. They were broken off because of their unbelief, but you stand fast through faith. So, Do not become proud, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. What Paul does in the end of chapter 11 is he warns Gentile Christians about spiritual arrogance. Um, Do not be arrogant means to be kind of to triumph over They might not be saying it, but Gentile Christians in this place have a kind of trash-talking attitude towards Jewish Christians and Jews in general. They ignorantly assume that God benched the Jews and chose Gentiles to occupy their space. And Paul is attempting to set them straight. What he says is branches were broken off. That's what the, the kind of the thinking of the Gentile Christians in these house churches, branches were broken off. That's describing Jews so that I might be grafted in. And the way it worked with an olive tree sometimes, in order to facilitate growth, you broke off some of the branches and grafted in uh, branches from wild olive shoots. And that's what Paul is describing, Uh, but he lets the Gentiles know that they, the Jews were broken off in order to make room for Gentiles to be grafted in. And what we're going to see is that God uses exclusion of some to foster the inclusion of others. It's likely that anti-Semitic, anti-Jewish sentiment had begun to surface in Rome, and Paul is trying to head it off. The shame is, I've talked about this before, how quickly the church ended up really moving into anti-Semitism. And that, as we'll find, the reason why you would land in a place like that is because of not understanding how God works things in order to accomplish people entering into the kingdom. If you didn't understand that, you might have room for anti-Semitism. But what Paul is going to explain in terms of mystery and helping us understand, we'll come back and we won't really have room for it because we'll see how God dealt with the Jews, in order to allow the Gentiles to enter into God's family. And this is the thing. But the church didn't grab that. And just a couple of things. Uh, one, of the, one of the church leaders in the middle of the second century, Tertullian, argued the Gentiles had been chosen by God to replace the Jews because they were worthier and more honorable than the Jews. Now, what Paul will say in this section is that's absolutely not true just not true. Uh, Fourth century church leaders were even more hostile. Uh, There was a church leader named John Chrysostom. And this guy had some decent things to say, but in some ways he just, he didn't see some things. He went so far 
to say that because Jews rejected God in human flesh, they deserved to be killed, grew fit for slaughter. And that's what he taught. Um, about the same time, Augustine, who had some wonderful things to say, he argued that Jews should be left alive in suffering as a perpetual reminder of their murder of Christ. All these kind of attitudes, what we'll understand, if you understand how God does what he does and what, why he did what he did, it removes this kind of thinking from your thoughts. You can't have it, and that's what we'll find. But to go on, even somebody is, is and he, he changed toward the end of his life. Martin Luther wrote a pamphlet on Jews and their lies, and at one point in this writing, he goes far as to write that we are at fault in not slaying them. Uh, it, and one of the historians indicated that some of the kind of thinking that led to the Holocaust kind of comes from sources like this. To his credit, Luther did soften his stance toward the end of his life. And what we have in the final sermon, what he says is, we want to treat Jews with Christian love and to pray for them so that they might become converted and would receive the Lord. It was Paul whose insight staved off anti-Semitism. He was given insight by Jesus himself into God's mysterious ways. Look what it says in verse 22. Note then the kindness and the severity of God. Severity toward those who have fallen but God's kindness to you, provided you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you too will be cut off. And even they, referring to Jews, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in. For God has the power to graft them in again. For if you were cut from what is by nature, a wild olive tree, and grafted according to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, the natural branches, be grafted into their own tree? And again, what Paul indicates is that Gentile Christians are being grafted into a Jewish plant. And God can do that, but what God can also do naturally, if some were broken off, he can graft those back in. The fact is, God had broken off a majority of Jews in order to graft Gentiles in, the grafting in of Gentiles, that represents the kindness of God. The breaking off of unbelieving Jews expresses the severity of God. But God is fully capable of grafting natural branches back into his good graces. Uh, Paul understands that Gentile arrogance is rooted in spiritual ignorance. And what he will lead to in a lot of his writings is using comparison to make one feel more secure is not a pathway to deep faith and confidence. Seeing, well, I might not be much, but I'm better than, or I'm more loved than, that is a way to try to bolster security, but it doesn't really work well. Paul enlarges there in our vision of God in order to deepen their faith. Um, look what it says in verse 25. <clears throat> lest you be wise in your own sight. I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved, as it is written. The deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. And this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Mystery is an important word to understand. We like mysteries. You know, there are, there are mysteries where the story is progressing and it's not really clear who killed who and how did he do it. And a good mystery keeps you guessing until the final end when you figure it out. There are some um, great mysteries. And when it's applied spiritually, it's, it's not that it's difficult to discover. That's what a good mystery is like. It's difficult to discover. I didn't know that he was going to be the one to do it, but there were the clues. That's a good mystery. Does, a mystery does that biblically. 
it isn't difficult to discover. It's impossible to discover. That's a biblical mystery. It's not difficult to discover. It's impossible to discover until it's revealed. So nobody's going to see it until God says, let me show you something. And he unveils it. And at that point, it's possible to know what was not known prior to that time. What Paul says to the church, and especially to Gentiles, I don't want you to be unaware that there is a mystery at work here. No one in the Old Testament saw it. It wasn't revealed. It was revealed kind of through Christ and more fully actually through Paul, who was told about this mystery. Um, The mystery is that, again, we'll talk about that God hardened the hearts of some Jews. In fact, most Jews. What individuals said, the Jews, they were responsible for the death of Jesus. What it's saying here, the reason for their unbelief, that was directed by God himself. The mystery is that God hardened the hearts of most Jews to the message. It wasn't something where God says, okay, I'm not going to interfere. There's there's some, there's a, a word for how some people think God acts. It's called deism. Deism is when God kind of puts the world in motion and he steps back. And he doesn't interfere and he doesn't push his agenda. That's not what Paul is describing there. There's another word, theism. Theism is different than deism. Deism is God stepping back, kind of putting things in motion and not being directly involved. Theism is different. It's God determining and directing. And what God will say relative to how he manages salvation history, God does not adopt a hands-off attitude. He is directing things. That's what Paul will indicate. And that's kind of the the mystery. Um, The mystery is that God hardened the hearts of Jews. He engineered their disbelief. It's not that Gentiles were spiritually wiser and we saw things that the Jews should have seen. It wasn't that most Jews weren't seeing It's that they could not see. Because God says, no, I don't want you to see. And that's what Paul's indicating here. God purposefully blinded Jewish eyes in order to foster Gentile faith. He excluded some Jews in order to include some Gentiles. That's what Paul's saying. Jewish unbelief allowed the Gentiles to enter into God's family. It says a partial hardening has come upon Israel. A partial hardening doesn't mean that all of them were kind of hardened. It means that a part of them were completely hardened. It's a part of Israel was allowed to see. Most of Israel was not allowed. They were blinded by God to that Uh, When the fullness of Gentiles, what it says, when the fullness of the Gentiles enters in, we don't know what that means literally, but at some point, as we've kind of illustrated, at this point, God's waving Gentiles in. And it still hardened some Jews to who Jesus was. That's purposeful. It's not that they missed it. At some point, we don't know what, when the fullness of the Gentiles comes in, God's going to say, enough. And he's going to turn back to his firstborn. And we don't know exactly what that looks like, but he's going to wave them in. And the hardness that had been put in place will not be, will not be there anymore. And all Israel will be saved. It doesn't mean every single Israelite, but in as much as some Jews believed and some didn't, there's not going to be a portion of Israel that will be excluded from seeing as existed in the first century. That's exactly what happened. And if you're a Jewish congregation, God opened the eyes of some and closed the eyes of others. 
at some point in the future, that disparity will cease. And it doesn't mean that every single Israelite, but there won't be a portion of them that is kept in the dark. That's what Paul is indicating. And we need to recall again why Paul is doing this. Why is he communicating this mystery? And the reason is so that we don't feel better than, so that we don't fall into the trap of spiritual arrogance and anti-Semitism. To understand what God's doing, if you see how in charge God is, arrogance and anti-Semitism cannot exist. Can't. God's too powerful. He's too big. He's too in control. Um, That's what we're going to find. Um, Gentile Christians at this time were tempted to believe that God has chosen them because they were superior to the Jews. It's not true. Look at verse 28. As regards the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. As regards the gospel, what he says, they are enemies for your sake. Who is you? That's who you are. For Gentiles, me, us. They were enemies of the gospel, blinded to the truth of the gospel, so that God would wave us in. That's what Paul is indicating. But as regards election, I don't know what it is about this. I really like this. I really like what this says. As regards the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers. God never cultivates a relationship with his children and then lets them go and turns from them. He doesn't. He's too good. He's too holy. He's too righteous. He's too powerful. He doesn't kind of bench somebody who didn't work out well. I'll tell you what, I'm glad about that. Um, And look what it says. The gifts and the calling of God. What a great word. Irrevocable. He can't revoke it. You know what that means? He doesn't repent of it. It says in the Bible, there's some place God repented of this and that and the other. And what Paul is indicating here, that it might appear that God gets caught in a corner. You know, he doesn't see this coming. And some people believe that, you know, in the garden, God really wanted it to turn out different than it did. But, you know, he couldn't help it. He's standing back here, just kind of watching things happen, not really being involved. That is not a picture of God. It's not a picture. God is, he uses mysterious ways. Mysterious isn't just puzzling, ways that we cannot fathom. They're inscrutable, unsearchable, untraceable. We we can't figure it out. Let me tell you what's going to happen. Let me tell you. A hundred years from now, we're all going to be there. And here's what we're going to do. We're going to say, you know what? Did you ever imagine that God would do this, this, and this to accomplish what he's accomplished? Geez, I didn't. Did you imagine? Can you imagine that? We're going to stand around and we're going to go, how great is he? He uses that to accomplish this and this to accomplish that. It never occurred to me that God could do anything like this. And we're going to spend eternity just agape at his wisdom and his goodness and his Mercy. All God's ways end in mercy. The mysterious. We can't see how it will end in mercy. But that's where the road ends. When you are a child of God. You're going to follow him and you're going to get to the end and you're going to find all kinds of people getting mercy. I'll tell you what. I think it's a really good move to follow God. He's so powerful, and he's so big, and he's so good. And um, The gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. God doesn't make a mistake. He doesn't wash his hands of someone that he's involved with. He just doesn't do it. He doesn't do it. Um, most Jews resisted the content of the gospel. They fought 
It's being propagated in the world. This wasn't merely allowed by God. It was caused by him. Caused. With respect to the gospel, they were enemies. With respect to being included in salvation, they are not thrown out. God made some promises to Abraham. Through you, every nation on the earth will be blessed. And you know what he's doing? Fulfilling his promise. Uh, God is not put on the defensive by human or angelic interference. There's nobody that can get in the way of what God's doing. Humans can't. Angels can't. It's just not possible. And that makes sense, doesn't it? If God is who he says he is, the creator, can anything thwart the purposes of the creator? It doesn't make sense, does it? It doesn't make sense. And that's what Paul's saying. Um, God uses mysterious ways to achieve merciful ends. Look what it says in verse 30. For just as you were at one time disobedient to God, but now have received mercy because of their disobedience, so they too now have become disobedient, in order by the mercy shown to you, they also may now receive mercy. Um, what does that mean? Let's talk about what does this mean? One thing you got to know, the word disobedient here, there's different kinds of disobediences. This is disbelief-based disobedience. Disbelief-based disobedience. What this disobedience is about is me not really trusting you. If you're supposed to be good at something and, and I don't trust you, you could tell me, do this and that. And because of this disbelief, um, and I'm not going to do what you tell me to do. Not because, well, because I really don't trust you. That's, I'm not, and the reason for the, the, the mistrust, I don't think you have my best interests in mind. That's why I don't trust. That's, that's this kind of disobedience. It's disobedience rooted in disbelief. Now listen to what it says. Here's what, here's what it's saying. You were at one time, and it's speaking, I think, of Gentiles, were at one time disobedient. And here's what it means. At one time, Gentiles were saying, I'm not going to do what he says. I mean, why should I? He doesn't like me. He's not, I can't trust him to do good for me. And that's what it's describing. We were at one time disobedient to God, but now have received mercy because of their disobedience. You know what this, you know what it's talking about? In the Old Testament, in the Old Covenant, if you weren't a Jew, you really didn't have much hope. Okay, can we, let's, Let's stand by the Red Sea when God is leading the Israelites across. And we're watching, and we're Gentiles, and we're watching, whoa, man, did you see that? He's allowing the Jews to go in and to walk through the, the Red Sea on dry land. Boy, God's amazing. And here come the Gentiles, the Egyptians, and the water rushes in and kills every single one of them. And you know what you and I are going to experience at that point? Disobedience. Disbelief-based disobedience. You know what we're going to feel like? Outsiders. We have no claim to being cared for. Look, look what he did. And that's where we were. Just kind of outcasts, kind of knowing about the God of Israel, but not really being in a position where we can expect him to do anything for us. And then you know what he did? He turned the tables and he sent his son and to most of his firstborn, he said, no. You will not understand what he's doing. And they didn't. He claimed to be king of the Jews, but he was not. Well, he challenged most Jews. And you know what he ended up doing? 
doing miracles to Jewish Christians and to Gentiles. Hey, let me do this. And you're not trying. And you know what happens at this point? When you see what's happening over there, you felt like, and you know what you're, you're, you know what you're feeling like now? He, 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 he's, he's talking to us. He's talking to you. He's talking to, you know, we who kind of was, felt like we don't need, and now he's waving us in. And so that's what ended up, so we now feel like the included ones. What do you guys feel like? Now you're the excluded ones. Now Jews are saying, nah. No. And they, you're going to be in the place where Gentiles were by the sea, by the Red Sea. That's what he did. So now here's the deal. It says, they too have been disobedient. He's talking about Jews now. In order that by the mercy shown to you, they might also receive mercy. You know what God does? And again, it's kind of strange. He makes different groups jealous. By the Red Sea, we would have been jealous. Boy, I'd like to have a God like that. And once we're in that point of jealousy, then he said, I've got a gift for you. Mercy. Because God's mercy is always given to people who don't think they deserve it. That's what mercy is. A gift given to somebody who knows they don't deserve it. So God creates exclusion so that when he gives eternal life, do you, do you deserve it? Do you deserve this? No, you know you don't. And that's what mercy does. Mercy is a gift given to somebody who doesn't deserve it. It's a gift, never a paycheck. Never. So God allows some people to feel distant so that when he gives them a gift, it's a gift. Eternal life is a gift. It's not given because you deserve it. It's given when you are at the place where you understand, I don't deserve it, then it's mercy. God is absolutely committed to mercy. In fact, he'll use exclusion and inclusion. So now, many Jews are at the place where they feel they have faith, but relative to Jesus, they don't feel close to him. What's going to happen? That's going to change someday. When the fullness of the Gentiles comes in, He's going to turn to his firstborn. And I don't know how this is going to work. Look what it says in Zechariah, though. That the verse, here's what it says. I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy so that when they look on me, on him whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn. It will happen someday that Jews will look back and God will lift the veil from their eyes and they will understand who Jesus is. And at that point, they will flood towards him. Every single one, no. But as a nation, they will pile in because God will remove the blinders. Um, God has divined, designed salvation history in a way that saving grace always surprises its recipients. Surprises its recipients. They don't think they should deserve it. And he gives it in spite of the fact that they don't deserve it. Jews will be grafted in again at some time in which Gentiles will be tempted to believe that they are superior. And that is kind of where we are these days. You know, we as feel as Gentiles, and again, the church is, yeah, that we are loved and we might have the sense, Paul was afraid of it at that time, that he was dealing with a sense of spiritual arrogance on the part of Gentiles and what he's telling them about this mystery, about how God blinds in order to invite and then in order to help them override that. Um, 
God uses exclusion to foster inclusion. And once Gentile inclusion is complete, Jewish inclusion will, will commence on a national scale. Um, these chapters are not focusing on individuals. They're focusing on groups of people. Calls and predestines. It's not talking about individuals. It's talking about group. God extending favor to those who don't merit that favor. And God's mercy, again, is always a gift and never a paycheck. Those are mysterious ways. You might say, boy, Mike, that's kind of confusing. You know what the deal is, what we can know? At the end, it's going to lead to mercy. Uh, look what it says. God has consigned all to disobedience, verse 32, in order that he may have mercy on them all. This statement captures chapters. Now, let me tell you what this means. There's, there is a, let me see, which way? That way. The way they used to fish is they'd take these nets and they would work it and they would throw the net. I was in Belize, Central America back in the late 80s for a couple of mission trips. I was taking some kids on. And we saw this guy fishing and he was fishing the way that they fished back in the first century. He had this net and he spun it and then tossed it out and it had weights that caused it to go down in the water. And then he started pulling and what it did then, big net, and it, it snared fish inside. And he would pull it in and it was, had a bunch of fish in it. That's the way they fished. And when it says, God has consigned all men to disobedience, and do you remember what kind of disobedience this is? Disbelief-based disobedience? God nets all people in disbelief-based disobedience. It's like he throws the net and catches everybody, Jews and Gentiles, in this net of, and if we see ourselves in this net, uh, he, just, he doesn't like me. He's like you. No, he doesn't like me either. He nets all people in that. Why would he do that? He nets people in this sense of being excluded. So that when he takes the net and begins to open it, to release you, you will understand this is a gift. It's not a reward. It's not something you earned by being good and holy and righteous. It's a gift given because of mercy. Why do we need to know this? So that we don't look down on others. Can I tell you else why we, know, we need to know it? In order that we might not exclude ourselves. Some of you were okay coming into a relationship with Jesus, but you haven't changed as much as you think you should have. And you think because you haven't changed that God's probably changed his mind about you. That in the beginning he was willing to invite you in, but now you're really not pulling your load. And some of you feel how can we believe something like that? It was never about what we did. It was in spite of the fact that we can't do. That's what mercy is. God will not turn away from you because you don't do it well and say it right. Here's the question. If you had a sense for God's mercy, a bigger sense, how would that impact you? That's what Paul's trying to do in this verse, giving us an image. I tell you what, I get the sense as Paul's writing this, I don't know what it is about this verse. I don't know if he's sobbing or laughing. He is so taken up. Can you imagine what it was like for him? an apostle to the Gentiles, and everywhere he goes, his countrymen. I, 
they're angry and, and he feels like he's turning from them and he feels like he's enraging them. And, and you know what Jesus ended up showing him? Paul, come here, come here, come here. You had a difficult task, I know. I sent you to Gentiles and you incurred the hatred of Jews. Paul would have said, I know. Let me tell you what's going to happen, Paul. And I think Paul sees this now. They are not excluded forever. I'm going to, you did well, Paul. Then now I'm going to invite them back in. I think Paul sees this thing happening and I, well, look what, look what he ends up going into. Look at verse 33. I, I, all the depths of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind? (laughs) I just think he's just so absorbed in who God is. He just, his mouth is agape and tears are falling from his eyes. He goes, oh my. I don't know that there is a more profound verse in the Bible than this one. When you think of who is writing it and why he's writing it and how caught up he is with the wonder of this. Transported. I, who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. I mean, you know the point Paul is making? Do I have one on here, John? Yes. Thank you. I think he's making this point. You are connected to God. And because you're connected to God, you're connected to good because God is good. Now, his, the fact is, next. And what connects you to God one more time? It's mercy. Mercy. Connected to the mercy of God is a connection that you cannot get out of. You're connected to God, connected to good. Brett, have a closing song. We pray for us. God, we, this morning we, we end up looking at things that we don't fully understand. We, we see things and things you told Paul about how you operate in the course of salvation history and we catch a glimpse of the fact that you're in control. We don't completely understand it. It seems really good news. It is something you would have us do. We get our gaze and glance mixed up. We gaze at our behavior and glance at you. Gaze at what we do and don't do and glance at you. Gaze at our ability to comply with your commandments and we glance at you and you would have us do it the other way around. To gaze at you and your commitments and glance at ourselves. To gaze at your purposes and promises and glance at our compliances and in as our vision of you becomes broader grander deeper it does cultivate within us trust and obedience and love pray you'd help us to see you as you are and to gaze at that in jesus name amen